Are you tired of your intuition being drowned out by the noise of life? Are you ready to awaken your psychic abilities and listen when the universe tells you something? Listen as this best of episode gives you practical tips to tap into and amplify your intuition. Plus heal those parts of you needing attention. If you've been wishing for some kind of shift, you're in the right place. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Hope, the show where we take you off the hamster wheel by ditching your to-do list for the to-don't list. I'm Lauren Abrams, and I get to help you feel that magic again since going through my own dark night of the soul so you can learn from my experience and the mentors and experts I meet along the way. Enjoy this best of episode and get practical healing tips for your life right now. Starting off as intuitive and author, Kelsey Aida. How did you get introduced and find all your gifts and how would you help someone else tap into their intuition? Like how could they, if they're listening, tap further into theirs? Yeah. So something that I've been exploring ever since the psychic gifts open up is trusting my intuition and trusting the information that comes through and not judging it right away or trying to put a label on it or trying to figure out what it means. Like just letting it come through and then observing it be like, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. Like getting curious about it. Cause sometimes like I'll write something down and I'll be like, I don't know where that came from, but that is fire. I'll read it back and I'll be like, that is so good. <laughs> that is what the people need. That is what I needed. And it just comes through and you're just like, whoa, where did it come from? And like, when I ask, where does it come from? Sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's the universe. Sometimes it's like my spirit team or my higher self. But at the end of the day, it's all really like different fractals of the same thing. I would say you have to give yourself permission to receive information, first of all, to receive the insights, no matter if you like them or if you don't like them, because sometimes you're not going to like what you receive. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm doing that. Or that's going on. Or <laughs> yes, I need to change this or whatever. But letting yourself receive it, letting yourself not judge it, and then just practicing. Even I'm still practicing with clients, with friends, with family. I'll be like, hey, can I do this reading on you? Hey, let's do this new technique that I learned. So I feel like I'm just always learning, practicing and like using the gift. It's like a language, right? It's, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I'm just trying to use it as much as I can. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true. I feel like every time I jump out of the shower, I'm like writing down what came. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good time like, to receive information. Yeah, it is because there's no, that's the whole thing about put down, or take a walk without a device. It's, and it's also the getting outside part, but it's so true because that's where the downloads happen. It might yeah, not be walking for you, but oh, no, you're a big one. No, I want to hear. Oh, I was going to say I'm a big journaler. So I like to do a yeah. lot of my intuitive work in the journal so I don't lose yeah. it. So like I'll pose a question to my spirit team, let's say if I'm struggling with something, and then I will just journal the answer so I have it in writing so I don't forget. Because sometimes yeah. if you're just doing it all in your head, it comes really fast and you're like, oh, I forgot already. Or if you yeah. like voice record yourself to you're on a walk or something, that's helpful. Uh, what's the hardest challenge you've ever gone through and how did you get through it? I would definitely say the hardest challenge was the heartbreak of not becoming a professional dancer because that's what I had banked on for like my whole entire life from age two to age 17. So almost 10 years of, okay, this is my timeline. This is my life. This is what I'm doing. I'm really focused. I'm really aligned. And then feeling like my body betrayed me by becoming injured and feeling like, God, what the heck? I thought you created me for this, but now you're taking it away and I don't understand. And that identity crisis that I went through during the depression and all of that was really tough because I had really wrapped myself around the identity of being this artist, being this dancer, being this ballerina. And that's, that's all I am, which is not true. But at the time, that's what I felt and believed. And so I think mourning the loss of that timeline, and then just realizing that everything that I was trying to get through dance and performing, like feeling graceful, feeling beautiful, channeling God's energy, feeling strong, feeling like my presence is like giving a positive effect to other people, like all of those things, I can still access in other ways. And finding other ways, creative ways to access them has really been, I think, the most healing part. And then just not tying myself to such a limited identity anymore and just being me. Like I'm me and I do a lot of different things, but I'm not any of those things. And just really letting myself be bigger than what I'm doing or what I love. Yeah, oh, I love that. Do you have a message of hope you want to give? A message of hope. 
Yeah, this has been something that's been coming through lately, like a message for everybody. And it's really to let yourself dream and to let yourself go for those dreams, even if you don't know how it's going to manifest or when it's going to happen, or you don't know if it's possible. Like, I think you owe it to yourself and everyone to go for it. Because if you genuinely want something in your heart of hearts, there's a reason why. And if you're withholding that from yourself or the world, you are doing both a disservice. So I would say the message of hope for today is to dream big, let yourself dream big and go for it, even if it's hard or scary or you don't know how it's going to happen, because just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't. But I absolutely think we're all hardwired with intuition. So all joking aside, I do think we have access to it. I think it's a deep inner wisdom. And, you know, we've forgotten how to listen to it, you know, and how the information comes to us. But we all have that wisdom within, especially in these trying times when so many of us feel stuck and we're trying to figure out next steps. It's an invaluable skill to have. It is. And people are like, well, wait, how do I do that? I want to do that. And how did you get started? So that's three really huge questions. Right, right, <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah, oh my gosh. You know. Yeah. But I love giving people practical information about how to trust it because it is, it is invaluable. You know, we all get it in different ways. In a weird way, it's kind of like learning a language, but you're kind of, it's unique to you. So the main, the, well, I'll start by just defining what it is. I mean, that probably the quickest definition is simply quick and ready insight. But I think of it as sort of divine wisdom that we're all hardwired with it. We all have that wisdom from our soul that's guiding us. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that it's that, you know, a booming voice Lauren, here's what you're meant to do. Here's your next step. Or here's your mission in life should you choose to accept it. Anyway, it doesn't come that way. It comes as a, a, a might be an aha moment. It might be a still quiet inner voice. It's kind of a whisper. Sometimes we just have synchronicities and coincidences that begin to happen that kind of guide us in the right direction. Sometimes it's a dream. I often find when I'm asking my own intuition for guidance, the synchronicities and coincidences often show up like I'm guided to the right conversation or maybe to listen to this podcast or to read a book or, you know, to it's like the answers can come from other people, too. But it starts to come when you're going, what's my intuition saying about this decision or this issue? So I think we can kind of allow ourselves to be open to that guidance. Do you have a message of hope you want to give? You know, I think it really is that it's, you know, we're all in a transition and that the bad times don't last, that they do get better and that they can change and keep your focus on what you want, not what you don't want. I mean, that's what those guides say to me, said to me. And that's probably the thing that's held me through all of these dark times that I've gone through is that these dark times don't last. They don't last. You'll get through it. You have the strength and they're happening, you know, for you, not to you you know, that they're helping you become strong in maybe the weak places or the broken places. And that you'll also be, you know, able to help other people who are going through these dark times like Lauren's doing, you know, that her dark night of the soul has really opened up this energy to be able to help others. And, you know, we're all going through that right now. I mean, through one thing or another, I mean, COVID really decimated a lot of us emotionally and spiritually and financially. And so, you know, you might be here going through that just to lift other people up and find your own tools where you can be helped to somebody else. I always try to remind myself, this is just something I'm going through right now. It's not going to be permanently the situation. And that's one of the things I love about Qigong is that it's a lot easier than Tai Chi. And when people call the office and they say, Chris, what practice should I do? Should I do Tai Chi or should I do Qigong? I say, if you want to improve your health quickly, and if you want a tool right away that, to help you with emotional trauma, past and present, then Qigong is what you need to do. Now there's different styles of Qigong. The style that I teach in particular is based upon what they call the five element school. And the five element school, we recognize that the five major organs of the body, your heart, your lungs, liver, spleen, and kidneys are mainly responsible for sustaining life. And uh, these organs have different negative emotions that will affect them. And it will show up as so many different types of chronic disease, inflammatory diseases, and chronic pain. So if you want to get out of pain, this is definitely one of those things that a person needs to have in their toolbox besides a healthy diet, besides hydrating, besides sleeping and not eating processed, processed foods, really being able to take a pause and go inward. And, and like you said, it's so simple to do. It does not discriminate against anybody. We teach for the special Olympics for a program called healthy athletes, strong minds. 
and we have paraplegics doing Qigong. And, and even if you can physically do it, mentally you do, because even the specific meditations that I teach, actually I recorded 12 more that's, we're going to wrap up this year. And each meditation, Qigong meditation, everything is meant to do something with this inside of the body. It's not just the mindfulness aspect It's meant to do something with this inside the body. So yeah, it's really cool. It's easy to do. And the other fun thing is that you don't have to believe that for, for to see. Okay, good. So how can it cure a trauma? So how it cures trauma is what we do. So I'm just going to use anger, for example, because there seems to be a lot of anger and hate going on in the world right now. You think? <laughs> so anger gets stored in the liver and gallbladder. And, it gets, and so let's say you have, we'll get into more of the face feeding later. Let's say you have father issues and you can tell that by looking at daddy issues. You tell that by looking at the space between a person's eyebrows. So let's say you have these anger issues from maybe the father wasn't around, neglect or the mother, whatever. Wait, will it show up differently if it's a mom or the dad yeah, or no? That's, yeah. That's, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, what unlike conventional therapy, where sometimes, and this is just speaking from my own interaction with therapy years ago, is that sometimes I would leave and it would be like they picked off the scab, but I felt worse. It's like, oh man, I feel worse than what I did when I walked in. The difference with this is that, yes, I want you to focus on the trauma, what happened to you, who was involved, what was involved, and then... Yeah associated with the organ. So let's say it is old anger or resentment. Then you imagine a green cloud because the color green is associated with the liver and gallbladder. Imagine pulling that green cloud into the liver, visualizing the circumstance. Wait, do you have to know where the liver is in the body? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but do you need to know exactly where it is or like, especially like the gallbladder. I don't, I have no idea where that is. Yeah, Um, it's it's approximately. Then the liver is a big organ located on the right side of the body. But okay. just imagine pulling this green cloud into the right quadrant of the body and f- feeling and visualizing the circumstance. Then as you do the movement, let's say you're doing the liver cleansing move, or if you're doing the liver cleansing sound, which is the sound of shoe, like shouting, then you imagine that circumstance leaving like a dark cloud, going speed away from the body and deep into the ground. And when I'm uh, hired as a keynote speaker to give talks to trauma nurses and doctors, social services or whatever. One of my favorite Qigong practices to give is called the dry cry because your heart is the emperor empress of the body. It dictates how much of an emotion is going to be expressed or suppressed. So if you think about it, if you get angry, what happens? Your heart races and then it attacks your liver. If you're worrying about something, your heart races, then it'll spleen. If you're fearful about something, your heart races and it weakens your kidneys. It attacks your what does a spleen do anyway? All that spleen, the spleen that all those doctors have been taking out for so many years, that little spleen, that spleen is so important. Uh, we mostly hear about the pancreas and obviously the pancreas, but they're closely interconnected. The spleen is responsible for the production of white blood cells. It also recycled, oh, it also recycled good blood cells. But from a Chinese medicine model, that spleen also, what it does is it takes the food essence and the fluid from the stomach sends it up to the chest to be made into blood. That's one of the things it does. One of the many things it does. It helps to keep the blood within the blood vessels. So if you're somebody who bruises easily, for example, that's a spleen condition or have chronic bloody noses, that's a sign that you're worrying too much about something. It's weakening the spleen and, and that's hence causing the bloody noses. So, so have- what color do you bring to your spleen? Yellow or orange. Does it matter if you did yellow or orange? And by the way, for everyone listening, not watching, Chris was going more to his left side when he was talking about his spleen. His hands were going to his left. Probably you don't left even side. know that because you've been doing this so long. Yeah, the left the spleen is located on the left side of the body. It's about the size of, a, of an orange. And it has a lot of great, has a functionality. And a heart, for example, like I said, all these emotions go through the heart first. And some of the m- worst inflammatory diseases that I see in clinic is when a person does not, is completely detached from an emotion mm-hmm. or is not pressing it appropriately, then those are the worst diseases, inflammatory diseases that I see. And the heart healing sound is ha, huh, like laughing. And you could actually imagine a pink cloud filling up into the heart. The next time you're anxious about something, let's say you lost a friend, somebody passed away, a pet passed away or something. Imagine, feel that situation. I want you to feel it. Who's involved? What's involved? Or what is the feeling sensation? As you inhale, imagine that pink cloud filling up into the heart. And then as you exhale, imagine that circumstance leaving the body and do that over and over again. And the cool thing about this is that you could do it underneath your breath as well, too. 
So if you're in public, you're probably not going to be yeah, doing that sure. audibly, unless but, you're in certain parts of LA or San Francisco. Right, I guess so. But I have a question. You were saying if you're anxious, but that sounds like you're sad. Anxi you anx yeah, so yeah. anxious, anxiety uh, attacks the spleen. And okay. that's when we, and stomach. Now, if we're talking about grief and sadness and shame. Because you're talking about loss, seeing the loss of a friend or a pet and things. That sounds like being sad as opposed to anxious. Oh, I was running late to get here with the rains and the traffic and everything else. That to me was I, when I was thinking of anxious. That's. Yeah. So it's any of the emotions. So let's say you're feeling okay. anxious or you're feeling sad about something, or let's say you're feeling anger about something. Uh, you're feeling anxiety about something. You pull that pink cloud into the heart mm -hmm. and then our cell, make the hollow sound. And okay. uh, the emotion that actually affects the heart is overexcitation. Most people don't realize this, but you can actually die of a heart attack from laughing too hard. Hence the reason why when we laugh hysterically at something, the first thing we all do, everybody does this, is we go, ah, right? And the reason mm -hmm. why we do that is because the heart is trying to regain balance once again. That's what it's trying to do is try to regain that balance. So this is just a very simple Qigong practice. And instead of suppressing, you're able to deal with it as it comes up. Okay. So those are, that's three colors. We've got the orange and yellow uh -huh. on the left side. We've got green on the right side for the liver. We've got white got, for the lungs. White for okay, the lungs. We didn't talk about that yet. So white for yeah. the lungs. And what is that for? What are we feeling when oh. we're doing that one? So that's the grief. That's the loss. That's uh, okay. So that, yeah. So when you have, like I said, when you have a, an event that makes you angry, your heart races and then attacks the liver. When you, there's such a close interconnectedness between the heart and the lungs that your heart will hurt and then it weakens the lungs. In fact, you can always tell when somebody has lost somebody who has not processed the grief because they will develop an unproductive dry cough. That unproductive dry cough is actually the grief stuck in the lungs. And they'll go to their physician nine times out of 10, at least from what I've seen, they are prescribed an inhaler because they got some miraculous form of asthma that's occurred. And it's not, it's a grief stuck in the lungs. And so, so you how not... could you help them? How can you help them? Or how could I, like I hear I'm talking to somebody, I know that's what it is. And it's awkward for me to be like, oh, I think you have, you're not dealing with your grief. <laughs> you can't say well, that. Have... Yes, yeah, so you have to word it there. Yes, there has to be some bedside manners when approaching. So, I just yeah. heard Chris Shelton and I know what this is because somebody's yeah. coming to mind right now and I want to be like, listen to this. So, so yeah, so the conversation starts like, wow, you've had that cough for a while. When did it start? Oh, six months ago. Oh, what was going on in your life six months ago? That's how the conversation starts. Do you have a message I hope you want to give, even though I feel like that was a message I hope. Yeah, that really is it. And my new book that's coming out on healing back pain, I've been working on for 10 years and will be released this year. It's going to be, a, it's a, an informative book on how to fix neck and back pain yourself. And also it's a beautiful artistic book as well. So the whole idea here is that the yellow emperor has a message in his classic of Chinese medicine. It's an ancient textbook. He says to fight disease after disease sets in is like digging a well after one has become thirsty or forging one's weapons after engaging in battle, wouldn't that be too late? The whole idea of our conversation here today is self-empowerment, not waiting till that point that there is hope that, but even if you are in that space of suffering and in chronic pain or whatever, that there is hope because there is these practices that you can do that will empower you to be the best version of yourself. And they say that the, the superior doctor is one that can prevent disease before disease sets in. And the whole idea of this is that you become your own superior doctor, meaning that you have such an understanding of how your body functions that when a symptom shows up, you say, oh, okay, what can I do? Qigong practice, maybe switch diet or whatever to transform this disease myself. And I think people pleasing would definitely come into all of that. Okay. Sexuality. I mean, we can't just gloss over that because the shaming of girls or the conforming and everything else, uh, repressing, uh, there's just so many different things. Uh, right. So there, yeah, I mean, they are need space and room to explore this energy that's inside them, this, this identity that literally they can't do anything right, right? They're either too sexy or not sexy enough. Like, I mean, women can't seem to do anything right in this space and according to society. And 
what girls know and what they tell me over and over is just like they get blamed for anything that they do. And apparently the, all the responsibilities on their shoulders, right? Like we talk about dress codes, apparently what they, you know, what teaches a girl is that they are responsible for a boy's inclinations, that that's on their shoulders to manage for a boy, when of course it should be a boy's responsibility. And it's teaching girls that their body is a threat, that, and it, you know, it's interesting when we talk about clothes, uh, that's a huge identity ex exploration for a girl, her relationship to her clothes. So any even ounce or judgment, it, it's, it feels, it hits as shame and it has lasting ramifications. So we do need to be incredibly mindful about how we talk with girls about how they start exploring and expressing their sexuality at this age. Granted, why everyone tries to, to control this so intensely is because they want to protect. It's out of an intention to protect. And which is understandable because it's not safe out there necessarily, right? And, right. and that's why I start the chapter actually addressing sexual violence in a big way. And I am personally on the board of a nonprofit called A Call to Men, which is all about getting men behind the cause of ending gender-based violence. Because the truth is, if women could have ended it by now, we would have done so, right? Yeah. We have to have to turn to the dominant group that's in power here because it's, you know, we've named it violence against women, but it's actually male violence that's causing this. And why? Why is that? Those are the questions where I want to shift the conversation. You know, it's like, how could we raise our boys better? Only 11 states currently require in their sex education curriculum to teach consent. Only 11 states teach consent. And that explains a lot. We're not teaching. Yeah, Boys, it's what so consent? true. And I'm going to do a plug right now. I'm going to do a plug right now for my friend's book. Uh, consent. So, okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've seen the boys are confused too. I say this compassionately. I'm not trying to like villainize men or boys in any way. Like we, I'm just trying to put the focus where we need to rather than girls just bearing the weight of shame and judgment in this space. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's hard yeah. to, I mean, I, it's not that I, I don't have compassion for parents navigating this, yeah. but again, I'm like, kind of put it, positioning myself as the advocate for the girls, right? Like there's plenty, there's parenting uh, experts out there too that, you know, can get into certain other nitty gritties, but like, I'm trying to give the girls a voice right now. And that's what they want to say. So many people want to write a book. So let's turn to that because people are like, oh, I want to write it. Um, oh, who am I to write it? All the imposter syndrome and all of that kind of stuff yeah. that comes up. How have you overcome those things? How did you, did you sit down and you just wrote it? Yeah. Well, I do? think we had some author friends in my life that gave me some good advice and guided me through the process a little bit. But the first point of advice was actually to write, to start writing the book. <laughs> and I, I was in a position where I could just write the proposal first and take it out with an agent. And people are tempted to do that because you don't want to necessarily write a whole book before, uh, you know, you'd rather get paid to do it and so on. But by actually writing the book and I had a first draft before I got my agent, which ended up doubling and changing and stuff like that. But I needed to find out what was inside me, like what was actually the story that needed to be told. And I think if I had tried to pitch it into a proposal prior to doing that, it would have been different because I, I didn't actually know creatively, organically what was inside me, what story. And so by really honoring that creative flow and also my own authenticity, like it is such a creative authenticity journey, writing a book, where the more you can just be vulnerable, tap into what makes you unique, what is your unique story. Don't try to fit in some book writing box or what's normal that will not serve you. The more you can just understand what your uniqueness in the world is and write to that, the more it will pop. Okay. Did you go into a writing group or something like that? I did have a writing group just for just a, just a few months. So, and that was helpful, just like keeping me on track. I mean, there's definitely like a discipline. But writing a book <laughs> is a disciplined endeavor. It, I mean, you really have to set hours. That's something, if you want to write a book, like it takes really full commitment in your spirit to be disciplined enough to execute it. Do you have a message of hope you want to give? I'm going to just give something that just came into my brain, which is let yourself be weird <laughs> and, and embrace that. Because that's actually, I feel like such a, you know, people often think of weird as a bad thing. And I have just seen it as this portal into your authenticity. So often, the more you can just like shed the shoulds of what you should look like, should do, should say, and just be like, wait, no, that's my weird thing I do. And that's who I am. Like, and own it, the more you'll step into your power and voice.
Yeah. And the universe will rise up to meet you for everything you want to do and be when you are that. And nobody's paying that much attention, by the way. That's the other thing. <laughs> I've never thought of a diplomatic way to say that, but um, I just love that. For me, one of the darkest moments, and I, I don't know why it's, I think it's the definition of how society defines a man that stuck with me of, you know, I had this moment of, I couldn't protect my family if I wanted to. And I, you know, I, I lived in a nice community where I didn't have to protect my family, but yeah, just yeah. a man that, that, that came to me. And it was so heartbreaking to think if anything ever did happen, you know, at the time I could barely lift up one of my boys, which were 20 pounds at the time without excruciating pain. We'll get to that in a few minutes with your conscious creator, your whole community with men and old ideas and all of that stuff. So what did you do? I mean, you went to Germany or like you're flying around, they discover what's wrong with so it. And you're I didn't an end athlete, up physically, right? Yeah. You're, so I, this is on athlete, the tail end right? of an athletic career where, yeah, my, my physical body has been yeah, such so a big part of, of what I do and who I am. And of course, how I define myself from a, a place of my ego, mainly at that time. But, but yeah, the doctors didn't, they could not figure it out. They could not stop anything. So ultimately I had to make a decision and I had to say, you know, am I going to live in this dark place? Am I going to continue to get frustrated? Am I going to just cry? Am I going to just sit in this or am I going to figure it out and dig deep? And, you know, within me, I've just always had the power to, to pull out of things and, and look for the light. And so at that time uh, I had spoken with a friend and, and they said, you know, I know a shaman that I've heard that uh, Cambo medicine is is good for Lyme's disease and okay so you had been diagnosed at that point yes you knew. okay okay so yeah and going. for me you know for me so many people look at things and they think oh that must have been scary for me it was wow what a weight off of me yeah to when I got that diagnosis I have an answer I have yeah, something you to, know. to target to go after okay yeah. how do we do this now now you can and get so, to the solution if there is, and I yeah, got whatever. into the research hole and the, you know, I just went to town on everything and listen, I'll be vulnerable in here. I, everything under the sun. And so I did everything I could find and, you know, these little pieces started to get better, but I'll tell you my unlock was really when I, I, I spent a few days down in, in Vancouver with a shaman and I did mm -hmm. some, some work. So what did the shaman do? Cause I've been, so, I saw a shaman in Bali who I've, took my husband to see after that I like Amazing. you know he's just like I mean he looks like a shaman so I'm yeah. always curious no, she, I, she, yeah. she she was incredible so she she mainly deals serves a medicine called called cambo which is uh the secretion from a, an Amazonian frog and the frog is not harmed in the process don't worry when I did my research I I looked at this and I said okay it boosts your immune system cool I'll go do this and essentially I spent three days with her and it they burn into your skin and then they take the secretion and they put it on it and immediately it goes into your bloodstream and you purge okay so you you, you throw up and it's meant to have more of a purge as well with whatever free radicals are in your body and so for me again i was living in this this space of okay it'll help my immune system let's go boost up but ultimately on day three i had this spiritual unlock and um, the only way I can explain it is I literally felt something in the lower left side of, of, of my stomach click and shift. And there's more to this story. There's a longer story there of, you know, that morning I had a flock of birds like, like fly almost through me and I saw coyote and like there was these, the, the, my environment was sending me signals of, okay, we're aligned to really go in here. So, but I don't want to take people down, down too much of a path. Well, but it, from I that mean, were you time, told, were you, wait, wait. So, okay. Were you told look for signs or later did you think back and go, oh, there were signs? Were you noticing and not realizing I mean, you were the noticing? Birds, oh, okay. the, birds, the birds was, there. Was, I had no choice but to know it was a sign. The coyote I later pieced in, it was just like he should not have been there in that part of where I was and why he crossed my path. And then the birds... I actually have a video of this because it happened three times in a row. And anybody who I share this video with is like, wow, I felt that because they literally come right. There's about 300 birds and come right through me. And so it was a, an alignment of the universe letting me know, like, you're ready for this. This is the day we're going to move through this. And so I felt so charged up going into my final day. And you're talking after two days of, you know, it's, it's not the nicest process to go through, but it's healing. 
it was leaving that that it was just these you know these instances that I couldn't ignore right so I went into day three I had that that unlock and it's not a spiritual it's not a psychedelic medicine or anything it's you know but I had that spiritual tap in and I left having to just really look and listen and integrate everything I went through in those three days but coming out the other side you know in in diving into meditation and Joe Dispenza meditations daily and then breathwork was another piece of that. I had found breathwork in the previous so how, year. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. So how did you know to look up Joe Dispenza or breathwork or anything like that? Did the shaman recommend it or is it just, no. you just had this intuitive so, thought, I'm going to go online and look up like what just, what the hell just yeah, happened? So you, and- you know what? I'll, I'll, re, I'll rewind about, about a year. Listen here, I was a burnt out sales individual. Okay. I, I had, after the tail end of my athletic career, I came in and I, I was feeling really lost. And so um, I started to work with a friend of mine and I got as fit as I've ever been in my life. And he shared breath work with me for the first time, as well as, you know, I'd heard Joe Dispenza. And then it was after this peak where I was in the best shape in my life, mentally, physically, everything that the universe came and said, you didn't slow down enough, son. <laughs> That's when Lyme disease came into my life. So that's kind of how I, I have, you know, a good friend to thank for the breathwork introduction. Then I, again, like anything, when I, I feel high or I feel a little, you know, natural buzz or I feel get, you know, a boost of energy from someone's ideas, I'm like, I got to I gotta follow that, right? That's the flow yeah. calling me. So I did my own research. I read an amazing book called uh, Feel to Heal by Gitin Tonkov, one of the grandfathers of holotropic breathwork. And I just continued pick, picking up books. Then I started following that breathwork and meditation really became a staple and foundation pieces in my life, in my healing. I knew, I knew after that, that there was nobody else that could heal me, but me. And everything was up to me now, not in a, a heavy way, but in a beautiful way of, okay, Mike, you got this. This is up to you. You are the unlock to everything, you know? And so for me, again, they're the only message I had at the forefront of my mind was, this isn't just for me. Like, I have to bring this to every single human that I can and help them realize that they don't have to go through this crazy breakdown like I went through to realize how truly limitless we can be and how beautiful and amazing life can be and how connected we can be to our, our spouses, our kids, our environment, our food, like everything so my world just started to open and as i continued to listen to my intuition and follow the signs and hear you know the universe aligned to support me more and more as we continued to go do you That's have it. a message of hope you want to give although i feel like you just gave one um <laughs> yeah i mean my message of hope guys is is yeah as i said keep going but like Wherever you are is exactly where you are meant to be today. And whatever challenges in your life are in front of you, they are truly a gift to you. If you slow down and you look and you observe, and even though they may feel challenging, dark, and you know hard at the time, within everything life brings us are lessons, hands down, period. And it's always lighter on the other side. All we have to do is take another step and another step and look at what's right in front of us. You know, and that's truly where we're able to to unlock greatness within ourselves is as those steps become a little bigger and a little bigger and we keep moving forward. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode, the best of episodes, and take with you the messages of trusting the process, believing in your intuition and connection. Such great messages to take into your week ahead. Be sure to tune in next week for another empowering episode all about how to live authentically, abundantly, and how to simply feel better. It's also about embracing the lessons and growth from your life's journey. It's a great episode. That's next week. You don't want to miss that one. Be sure to share the episode with your friends and to rate and review the podcast so more people feel less alone in the overwhelm and to remember the pause. Answers emerge in the pause. And instead of adding to your to-do list, how about a to-do list? I love listening to these segments from the past shows. I've been setting intentions for everything I do these past few days, actually the past few weeks. And I feel like it makes such a difference. My intention here is to be of service in helping you remember that everything passes and taking a breath and pausing allows your own wisdom to emerge. You don't need a coach or another self-help course. You know your answers. They lie within you. 
Answers really do emerge in the pause, but we have to listen to hear them. Journaling and meditation are the best ways I found to get my answers. What are yours? I'd love to hear. Send me a note and also let me know what you're grateful for. Gratitude raises our vibration. I thought it'd be fun to collectively do that. We're also meeting once a month for an accountability meetup on Zoom. The next one's just in a couple weeks. Let me know if you'd like to join us. So far, it's been people who are starting podcasts, but it can be to stay accountable for anything you're doing. If you want to write a book or you're writing a book and you just want to stay accountable, get in a relationship and you want to start dating again, starting your business, whatever it is, it's a really safe community environment and love to have you join us. Please rate and review the show. It really does make a difference and be appreciated. I've been binge listening to this one guy. He's so funny. He's got these little 10 minute marketing episodes and at the end he says, even if this is the worst podcast you've ever heard, please rate and review. And then he goes on to talk about uh, reality TV and he was going crazy about the Golden Bachelor getting divorced or whatever. I didn't know it was I think he spends half of his 10 minutes talking about reality television. If you don't know how to rate and review, go to the website at 52weeksofhope.com. There's a button that says rate and review. Just click that and follow the instructions on that. So it does make a difference. It's social proof. So anyway, I appreciate it. Until next week, I'm Lauren Abrams. Thanks for listening.